church, would you stand with us on this first Sunday of Advent? We are just jumping right into the Christmas carols. So sing with us, oh come all ye faithful. enjoying the song so much I just kind of got lost in it. It's the first Sunday of Advent and you know that's that is a celebration where we remember the Lord's coming the first time but also when we think about the Lord's second coming. And so today we're going to have the uh, first lighting of the Advent candle this morning and doing uh, doing that is Gillanna which is our youth pastor's daughter, and she's going to come and do that in just a moment. But the custom of lighting the Advent candles in expectation of the coming of Christ is perhaps the most common symbol in the Advent season. The Advent wreath began in the folk practices of pre-Christian Germanic people who during the cold December darkness of Eastern Europe gathered wreaths of evergreen and lit fires as sign of hope in the coming spring and renewed light. And as we'll learn in a little bit, also this is a reflection of Hanukkah and the candles there that are used in Hanukkah. Christians kept these popular traditions alive, and by the early 16th century, Catholics and Protestants throughout Germany used these symbols to celebrate hope in Christ, the everlasting light. Today, the first Sunday of Advent, we reflect on the vigilant waiting of the Messiah's blessed birth. The prophets of old had said, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. For the zeal of the Almighty will accomplish this. Today our hearts and spirits are joined in the calm assurance that one day he will return. He will regather his people and lead them to the very presence of God, the Father Almighty. So we rejoice together 
as we celebrate his coming to earth and as we prepare for his second coming. So awaken us to you. There's a lot of things we bring into this season. Fears and sadness at times, God. And you have come. You've come to this earth to dwell in the midst of our humanity and all that that entails, God. And so awaken us to that powerful truth this morning. That you are Emmanuel, God with us. And God, I pray this morning as we sing these carols that sometimes can feel routine or sometimes we can just bypass the lyrics, God, I pray that they would rest deep within us. We just sing joy of every longing heart. God, I pray that as we enter into this season, may it not pass us by in the midst of hustle and bustle. But may we come deeper individually and as a church and as the church, closer to you, closer to the reason why you came on this earth. And God, as we remember how you came, may we be aware that you are here right now and may we be aware that you are coming again, all together, all at once. And that what beauty that is and that is what we stand upon this morning. And that is the spirit into which we can enter into worship, whether we're in a high or on a low. You are Emmanuel, God with us. 
And so we ask this morning that you would come. We know you're already here, but God, as we sing that, may we be making room in our spirits more and more for you. May we enter deeper into worship this morning. In your name, amen. Sing, oh, come. Place to be on Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Great spirit of worship. Hallelujah. Well, if this
time, I invite everybody to go ahead and have your seat. And girls and boys, if you're here, I invite you to come up here. I've got something very special I want to share with you. If you would come and sit right here so that you can see the large screen. Here they come from far and wide. God bless you this morning. I've got a book that I want to share with you called The Twelve Days of Christmas. And this book was written by someone who calls this their church home. Somebody who goes to church here. Her name is Helen Hadel. Many years ago, people wanted a, wanted a day in which to celebrate Jesus' birthday. Finally, 350 years after Jesus was born, December 25th was selected as Christ Mass, the day for his birthday celebration. The 12th day after Christmas, which is January the 6th, that was selected as the day to honor the visit of the wise men to Jesus. This day was called Epiphany. Everybody say Epiphany. Epiphany. And remember, that's January the 6th. This day was called Epiphany, and in 567, the 12 days between Christmas and Epiphany were filled with festivals, and they ended in a big celebration on the 12th night. Let's take a look at the song, the 12 days, and the gifts that were given on those 12 days of Christmas. No one really knows when or why the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas, was written. The legend is that during the 16th century, the leaders of the Church of England did not allow any religious teaching about Christ except theirs. So for the next 200 years, parents who refused to join that church used the song to teach their children in secret. Let's discover the 12 Christian meanings hidden in the gifts of this song. But first of all, we got to find out, before we find out about the gifts, the song calls the giver my true love. Everybody say my true love. My true love. Who could that person be? Who loves you and gives you many things each day? God, that's right. Well, the only one we know that can be is God. And from the scripture in James, it says, every good and perfect gift is from above. Having said that, let's read about the first day. What is the first and best gift in this song? Do you know what a partridge is? It's a small bird that looks like a little brown chicken. And this brave bird is willing to give its life to, vent, to defend its babies from any harm. Who does the partridge remind you of? Think of the one person who willingly gave his life for you. Who was that? It was Jesus. And remember what a cross is made from? A tree. So let the partridge in a pear tree remind you of Jesus, the best Christmas gift of all, who died for us on a cross. Scripture says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. All right, to make sure everybody's paying attention, we've got something to add to this story. So you, you've got 12 chances to make this good, and I think that we can make it all 12 just stellar. The first, the first service lacked a little bit, so I know you guys are awake. Here we go. One, two, three. On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a partridge in a pear tree. Man, that was better than day 12 <laughs> in the first service. Yeah. Yes. Okay. There you go. You're going to stir up something here, brother. It's the truth. <laughs> Turtle doves, also called doves are known as gentle birds of peace. And long ago, people gave doves to God as a gift of love. Jewish fathers and mothers gave two doves to God when they brought a newborn baby to the temple in Jerusalem. 
Well, guess what Mary and Joseph gave to God when they took Jesus to the temple when he was a baby? Two turtle doves, that's right. So, let the gift of two turtle doves remind you of the two doves given to God when baby Jesus was first brought to the temple. Scripture reads, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord and to offer him a sacrifice. Okay, here we go, kids. One, two, three. On oh, the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. Long ago, French hens cost a lot more than ordinary chickens. Only wealthy people could buy them. Well, what would these three expensive birds remind you of? Can you think of a Bible story about three important gifts meant for a king? Remember what gifts were given to baby Jesus? The wise men gave him three expensive gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is the most valuable of all, and frankincense comes from a tree bark and is burned during times of prayer. Myrrh is a thick reddish gum used as perfume. So let the three French hens remind you of the three costly gifts given to Jesus by the wise men. Scripture reads, When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Here we go. On the third day of Christmas, my true love gave to me three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. God created all kinds of birds, each with a special song. Have you heard sparrows chirp or pigeons coo? Have you heard blackbirds shout, call, call, call? <laughs> Have you heard of four men named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Yes, you have. They wrote about Jesus, and each of them had their own way to tell the story. They were like calling birds because the books they wrote called people to believe in Jesus. So, let the four calling birds remind you of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the four special books they wrote. Scripture reads, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. On the fourth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Gold rings are some of the most treasured of all gifts. Do you know someone who wears a gold ring? Yes, I bet you do. Jewish people consider the first five books of the Old Testament, which is the Torah, or God's law, to be five great treasures worth more than gold. Can you name these five books? They tell many stories of God, Adam, Eve, Noah, Moses, and Joseph. So, let the five golden rings remind you of the five valuable books of the Bible. Let's name them. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's right. Scripture says in Psalms, the decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. All right, is everybody really singing on these? I can't tell, but okay, it's starting to get good. Is she singing? She's not singing. She's, all right, sing, here we go. It's starting to get good. This is gold rings, come on. Here we go, one, two, three. On the fifth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me.
Do you know what people in China used to hand out when a new baby was born? They gave an egg to each of their friends. Why do you think they gave an egg? Remember what's on the inside of each egg? A new life, a new chick. Where does the Bible tell about six days of new life? The first two chapters of the book of Genesis. They tell how God made plants and fish and animals, a man and a woman. So let these six geese of laying remind you of the new life that God made in the first six days of creation. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good the sixth day. On the sixth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me six geese a lay and five golden rings. Four collie birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Pastor Doug, when I was little, I thought that the six geese were laying the five golden rings. Six geese are laying five golden rings. I, today, I, it's the first time I learned that that's not what the song meant. Moving on. <laughs> Have you ever seen a new baby swan? When it first hatches, the swan is black. It looks like an ugly duckling, and, but as it grows and changes, it becomes more beautiful. Its neck stretches out, and its feathers turn snowy white. How do you grow as God's child? The Holy Spirit helps you to change on the inside, in your heart and in your mind. The Holy Spirit gives seven special gifts to God's children, and these gifts Help us to grow and to serve others. So let seven swimming swans remind you of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Our scripture reads in Roman, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Here we go. Day seven. One, two, three. On the seventh day of Christmas, my true love gave to me seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying, five golden rings, four calling birds, three Anything to say? I, I, I will say this. In the first service, it started off real rough, but by day 12, it got good. And what I've noticed in this service is it started off real good. <laughs> Moving on. What food do all babies need in order to grow? Milk helps your bones grow strong and healthy like God wants you to be. Do you know how reading God's Word in the Bible is like drinking milk? God's Word helps you to grow in your heart, in your mind, and in your spirit. Jesus taught his followers eight special sayings called Beatitudes to help them grow strong in their faith. So, let eight maids a milking remind you of the eight Beatitudes. We find them in Matthew. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. <coughs> blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here we go, day eight. One, two, three. On the eighth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me 
Eight maids are milking, seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying, five golden rings, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Are you a happy person? Do you ever dance when you feel joyful? Do you know people who need more joy in their lives, or more love, or more peace, or patience? How does a person get all these things? God's Holy Spirit is our helper. He makes love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control to grow inside each of us. Those are good reasons to dance for joy. So, let nine ladies dancing remind you of the nine qualities that God's Holy Spirit produces in your life. The scripture reads, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Okay, here we go. Day nine. One, two, three. On the ninth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Nine ladies dancing, eight maids a milky Seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying Five golden rings Four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves And a partridge in a pear tree Long ago, lords were important men whose commands were to be obeyed. People honored lords and obeyed their rules. Whose rules do you obey? Do you know the ten important rules God asks us to follow? What are they? The ten commandments. They tell us what to do and what not to do. They show us how to love God and other people. So... Let the ten leaping lords remind you of the ten commandments which we are to obey. I will read them. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Here we go, day 10, one, two. On the 10th day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. 10 lords are leaping, nine ladies dancing, eight maids are milking, seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying. Pastor Doug, I think for the last two, we need to stand up when we sing. I think we will. All right, we'll, we'll have to do that. All right. <laughs> they seem excited. Yes. I can tell this is the second time you've done this. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting, I'm getting good at it, right? right Amen. Yeah. Years ago, a piper, listen, years ago, a piper was a man who traveled through villages playing happy tunes on his flute pipe. What do you think happened when the children heard his music? They followed him all over town. Twelve disciples followed Jesus everywhere he went, but only eleven faithfully stayed with him. Judas double-crossed Jesus. And like pipers, the eleven disciples piped the song of God's love everywhere they went. Many people listened to their message and followed Jesus too. So let 11 pipers piping help you to remember to follow Jesus. In the scripture, it says, These are the 12 he appointed, Peter, James, and his brother John, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. All rise. See, I was just kidding, but here we go. Oh, eleven, one, two, three. On the eleventh day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. Eleven pipers piping, ten lords a leaping, nine ladies dancing, eight maids a milking, seven swans a 
We can stay standing for this last <laughs> yeah. one. This is a good one. What is a drummer's special job? A drummer must beat out a steady rhythm so everyone can march or play music together in unity. What would happen if drummers stopped drumming? Christians belong to many different churches, but one thing gives them unity, their common beliefs. The Apostles' Creed lists 12 things that Christians believe about God. This brings oneness and unity, like a band marching to a drummer's beat. So let the 12 drummers drumming remind you of the Apostles' Creed, 12 important beliefs of Christians. And we'll read the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. He shall return to judge both the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Here we go. One, two, three. On the twelfth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. Twelve drummers drumming, eleven pipers piping, ten lords a leaping, nine babies dancing, eight maids a milking, seven swans a swimming, six geese a laying. Well, boys and girls, <laughs> Man, yeah, I knew that was coming. Boys and girls, you can return to sit with your moms and dads as we continue to worship God together. You guys may be seated. Good morning, my name is Brandon, and here are just some of the many great events that you need to know about. This is your last chance to buy tickets for Christmas with the Christ Church Choir. Join us this weekend on Saturday, December 7th, or Sunday, December 8th at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary for this amazing concert featuring our choir, the Nashville String Machine, our very own Kid Park Choir, and the Voices of Lee. Stop by the table in the foyer or the bookstore to purchase your tickets today. Please email philnitz at phil.nitz at ccnash.org with any questions. The Angel Tree is a ministry that provides for Christ Church families with children 16 years and younger who are in need of a little help this year for their Christmas celebration. Applications to be added to the tree are due by the end of today, and you can fill one out by visiting the Kid Park Center or emailing angeltree at ccnash.org. The angel tree will be at a table in the foyer next Sunday, December 8th, where you can adopt an angel and bless a child this Christmas. After you have adopted an angel, please drop off your gifts at the table in the foyer on Sunday, December 15th. For more information, please email angeltree at ccnash.org. Our bookstore is having a special 25% off sale through next Sunday, December 8th. If you haven't checked out the wonderful books, music, and resources, now is the perfect chance. This sale also includes any special orders, which will arrive in plenty of time for Christmas. Feel free to speak with our bookstore staff if you have any questions. Finally, this year's Senior Adult Christmas Brunch is coming up on Saturday, December 14th at 10 a.m. in the Martha Scott Hall. The cost is just $10 per person, which includes delicious food and a very special treat of Christy Sutherland in concert. Please sign up at the table in the foyer by next Sunday, December 8th. 
For more information, email Pastor Wayne Dismuke at wayne at ccnash.org. And those are just some of the many great things happening at Christ Church. For more information on these events, check out the online calendar at ccnash.org or pick up a bulletin at any information desk. Well, if you've been around Christ Church the past couple of weeks, you've heard us talk about the big give, and that's coming up next Sunday. And uh, I wanted to let you know that this week that the bags are here. So if you want to participate in that, and we hope that you do, this is where we as the congregation of the Christ Church, we get to go through our closets and we look for new or gently used clothing items or household goods that we can put in those bags. If it doesn't fit in those bags and you've got boxes at home that you want to bring, we encourage you to do that. Pastor Dan had a great idea in the first service that he shared with all of us. For those of us that are married, he thinks that we should get a his and a her bag. And so, like, I would get to go through Chris's closet and stuff the bag with stuff that <laughs> I might not appreciate looking at anymore, and he could do the same. But as I was thinking about that in between services, I know what he would put in his bag of mine, and I'm not so sure I'm ready to uh, part with those things just yet. But we hope that you will... Um, partner with us. This is a great way for us. Every hundred pounds of donated items that we give, they give us $10 in gift cards. And last year we had over 10,000 pounds donated. And just this past week, we, we had learned of a family that was in our community that had lost everything in a house fire. And we were able to give that family quite a few gift cards so that they could replenish some of the things that they had lost. So it's a great way for us to, to minister to our church community and um, the community at large. And we want to, I want to celebrate, we, this is our first Sunday of the month. And on the first Sunday of every month, we introduce our new Christ Church members. And we have several to introduce to you this morning. Most of them were in the first service. We do have a couple that are here in second service, but I'm going to read all their names just in case you know some of them and you'd like to, to recognize them l later. We have Kate Afaney, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. And Elise is her daughter. She's their first time members. And then we also have Dennis Bozick, Natalie Gentile, Susan Graham, Donica Henry, she's in the choir right there. And then we have Brittany Holt, Ryan Coker, Jessica Morris, and David Watkins. So if you would just welcome them as a new members to Christ Church. We are glad that they're a part of the family. Well, I want to take the time right now to just welcome those of you that may be joining us for the first time here at Christ Church. Our ushers are coming forward. We're glad that you've decided to, to join us this morning. We hope that you feel welcomed and that you will experience his presence. But the ushers have a, a connection card that we would love for you to fill out. So if you would just raise your hand with me and they can pass that to you and you can fill it out and either turn it into the, in the offering that's going to come by in a few moments or I, what I would really love for you to do if you have the time is to stop by our hospitality suite. We have people there that would love to just tell you a little bit more about Christ Church and the community. Um, either way, just please fill that card out so we can stay connected with you throughout the weeks and the months, the coming up, all the things that are going on at Christ Church. Well, I, I thought that I would drum up a little bit of a business for uh, uh, marriage counseling. Uh, with that idea of, uh, but Sterling shot that. I mean, you, you were really quick in the first service. I was saying, you know, the guys could go, go through the wives' closet and the wives go. I thought it'd be a, a moment of togetherness. He shouts out from the back, no. And I looked at his wife to see what she was thinking. She was also as adamant as he. And uh, I don't know, you know, that, uh, that this just seems like a moment maybe of working through my, the counselor in me says, use it as an opportunity to see what might be out there in terms of needing counseling or whatever. However you do it, make sure that you'll be able to participate in the, in the big give. I want to make an announcement I'm making all the way through Advent about our, about our offerings. Uh, uh, everybody that's been gone here for the last uh, many years know that coming through the uh, time of recession was uh, very difficult to the church. And uh, we had uh, indebtedness. A lot of our people were hit very hard with the, with the recession. So we had to have a lot of programs to go, and, uh, personnel and so forth. That created kinds of, uh, you know, a lot of struggles and challenges for people. So we've had a few years of considerable amount of challenges. But we're on the rebound, and, and things are, 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 are picking up steam again, for which we thank the Lord. You have been extraordinarily faithful in giving. So we've been able to 
not only pay down our debt, we've remained current, we've kept in the black all of these years, and that's been no small thing. So praise God for that. As we come to the end of the year, you've given faithfully through this year, but if God blesses you and you are able to give a, a gift uh, by the end of the year, and uh, to tra traditionally at Christ Church, there is a lot of end of the year giving. That would be a real benefit for us in these uh, coming months as we continue to build on the momentum uh, and putting back into place the kinds of personnel and uh, programming that uh, a church of this size requires. So I just ask you to be mindful of that. I said uh, in the first service, and I'll say it again, uh, for uh, any of you, however God blesses you, and I had this scenario come to mind. You're walking down the road, and all of a sudden you see a little slip of paper, and you realize some heathen has purchased a lottery ticket. And there it is. And you just pick it up, hopefully to find the rightful owner, but how are you going to find them? And then you find out it's a, a winner, $30 million. You know, that would be, the tithe of $30 million would be Three million. And then, of course, you, you wouldn't need all that money anyway. You might as well just go ahead and pay stuff off. It was the God's blessing he did that for you, you see, so that you could uh, keep the heathen from indulging that in bad things, right? I mean, let's just go with me for a little bit. Don't be so uptight about it. Just go with me. Make a joyful season. And I guarantee you that we'll re rejoice with you. A little bit of fun. Uh, thank God. Just keep that in mind when the end of your gifts, and we know that you will. Lord, what a wonderful season this is. We just uh, enjoy it so much. And thank you for our choir that will be uh, uh, pulling in so many people here this next weekend and uh, many of them not knowing you. And our hearts will, will be with them then as they do such an excellent job in communicating the gospel. And so, Lord, I just pray that in all this season we'll enjoy it. And I do pray you would bless our people. Our people are faithful in their giving. And I pray you will bless them because when they have, they give out of what they have. So I pray your blessings on them in this season. In Jesus' name, amen. As the ushers are receiving the offering, the choir is going to sing a new song that, we're, that we'll uh, sing next week at the, uh, at the concerts with the orchestra and everything. But uh, I guess we have nine brand new arrangements this year that we've never sung at, at Christmas concerts before, or anywhere for that matter. Um, so if you've been before and you're like, I've heard all those songs they're singing, not this year you haven't. So we'd love for you to be here this, uh, this coming weekend, the 7th and 8th, Saturday, Sunday night. And if you've never heard the voices of Lee, you want to hear them. They'll be singing about 30 or 40 minutes also, along with the choir and the huge orchestra. So come out. This song is uh, from John 3, 16 and 17. And Phil arranged it, Phil Nitz. And here it is.
God bless you. Would you stand just for a moment and greet one another in the love of the Lord? Thank you, choir. Uh, we look forward to the concert next week. We'll be supporting you, praying for you. I wanted to talk to you just a little bit. You know, the sermon's already been preached. That was the uh, 12 days of Christmas, which surely you'll never forget, especially with our minister of music. And by the way, there's a, a search now going on for new minister of music after today. Uh, he doesn't know that yet, so, uh, uh, you know, no, I'd, I'd, I'd get fired if I did that. So I, uh, uh, Christopher stays. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed that this morning. And and it's just fascinating to, you know, to watch how you can turn almost anything into a lesson to teach kids. And kids are geared to know that they're supposed to learn about Jesus at the church. Uh, it made me think today as I saw all, all the folks here uh, around Pastor Doug, and he was reading them the story that I heard about. There was a, a, a church where they were doing the children's uh, sermon, and so the uh, children's pastor said, And now, little girls... And boys, what is that thing that's green that sits on a lily pad and goes rivet, rivet, rivet? And some kid raised his hand and said, I know the answer is Jesus, but it sounds just like a frog. <laughs> and so you're always, you know, geared to like uh, know the right answers in church. And so kids grow up kind of knowing the right answers, which is a part of things. Uh, in the second chapter of the book of Luke, is where we get most of our information about uh, the early uh, uh, days of Jesus. If you think about it, we have very, very little information about uh, the Lord's childhood and, uh, and his adolescence. And so there's all kind of fantasiful tales told about the Lord and has been since the beginning. But the fact is we simply don't know. That wasn't included in the, uh, in the gospel record. And Luke was written by someone that was a second-generation Christian. He didn't know Jesus, and, uh, and uh, he had never met him. He came into faith after the church was already uh, up and running. And so he learned all that he learned from other Christians. But he tells us in the first chapter of the book of Luke, uh, Luke says, I went around and I uh, asked eyewitnesses who had been with Jesus what he did and what he taught. And so I have collected these stories together in this, um, now this presentation that I'm making in this book uh, to the man that he's writing, man by the name of Theophilus. Now, when we get to the second chapter of, I, seven cha second chapter of Luke, we begin to get information about the Lord's birth and his childhood all in one chapter. And the fascinating thing is, historians believe that this information probably came from Mary. Because there's a long tradition of, of, of Luke having gone to Mary, spent time with her, getting this information down. And if you'll think about it, this is consistent with the way moms talk. I don't know how many of you had the experience of going to a family reunion and all of a sudden your parents start telling these old stories about you and they keep getting uh, embellished as the years go on. You, you notice that? You know, it's like one, the first time you, you fell from an embankment that, you know, three feet, and then it becomes six feet, and then, and then it's like, you know, come from a second-story building, and, it, and, and all, this is the way moms talk, and, and, uh, and this child, you know, glowed in the dark when it was born, and it, it, it was unbelievable this child could do so many things, or on the other hand, he was such a, a, a almost, I thought the kid was possessed, you know, uh, into this and into that and into the other, and our our parents seem to embellish it, and they think that they're not. But, you know, uh, this seems consistent as Mary begins to tell Luke about the things that she uh, had experienced before the Lord's birth, after his birth. And so we get in the second chapter, uh, we get the story of the Lord's uh, birth uh, for several verses, and then it transitions into uh, the Lord's dedication in the temple uh, because all uh, Jewish uh, boys were taken to the temple for their circumcision uh, on the eighth day. And we have stories about, uh, uh, around that about there was prophe uh, prophecy about Jesus as he goes to the temple. And then it moves in about verse 41 in Luke chapter 2. It moves into telling us about something that happened when the Lord was 12 years old. 
Now, this follows a pattern of, uh, of older Christian groups to where you have the christening. A child is born, and then there's a christening where the child is baptized and given the Christian name and gets godparents and all of that. And then uh, the child is brought up in, in faith, and at uh, uh, 12 years uh, or so, uh, the child then uh, is confirmed. Uh, and, uh, and that was growing out of this Jewish pattern to where the child would be presented to the Lord after birth, and then there would be this time of teaching and training, and then at 12 years old, the bar mitzvah. And this was the Lord's bar mitzvah that's recorded in Luke chapter 2. And Mary is telling it and said, he got away from us, and when we found him, he was confounding all of the doctors of the law. He just had them right there. They couldn't believe this child knew so much, and, uh, and, and, and they were just stunned. And, uh, and then uh, one of the gospel writers uh, comments, this was, this was to be uh, fulfilled what the prophet said, the Lord whom you shall seek shall suddenly be found in his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. And I memorized that listening to Handel's Messiah, and that's, that's a part of it. And uh, I, I, I wanted to remember to tell you just a little story about that in just a moment. At any rate, what she is telling us is in this pattern of the Lord's uh, growing up days, that something happened between the time that, that he was presented to the Lord in the temple and the time that he comes from his, to his uh, bar mitzvah. And what, that was, uh, what had happened during those years was his training and teaching in the things of God. So by the time that Jesus came to the temple, he could say to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the rabbis and the priests in the temple, he could tell them all that he had learned. He knew the Ten Commandments. He knew the prophecies of Isaiah. He knew all the Psalms. Uh, most of the Jewish children memorized all the Psalms. They used these every day. How did they know all this stuff? Well, they knew it because the Lord told the ancient people of Israel that they were to teach their children when their children got up in the morning, when they went to bed at night, they were to write things over their doorposts, they were to put stuff up on their walls, they were to have certain ceremonies through the years, and all of these things were, uh, uh, were formed as a way of bringing up the children, the next generations, in the things of God so that each generation would have the content of the faith generation after generation after generation after generation. Now, this is one of the things we most admire about the Jewish people, that they do this so well. But this Christians have done this as well. And only recently have we not been as intentional as uh, past generations in making sure that our children know the structures of the faith. A few years ago, uh, well, actually, uh, I, it hadn't been that long ago, just a few weeks ago, I watched a documentary uh, that I believe you can get on Netflix about uh, the, um, when the uh, Hasidim, the Eastern European Jews, after the Second World War, came into New York uh, and uh, how they settled here. And uh, this, of course, after very traumatic events. And so uh, to what the reporter was asking, one of the rabbis is, gosh, we go through New York today and we see all these people with these curls and, and their hats and their distinctive clothing, and they, they are still retaining all these traditional ways from long time ago. And, uh, and, and these folks are successful bankers and business people of all kinds, and, uh, and they, uh, they, they're into uh, commerce and chemistry and all sorts of things, win all kinds of Nobel Prizes and so forth. What has made this community be able to thrive in this country and yet retain the distinctives of who they are? And the rabbi said, when we came to the United States, we observed things, and we were observing that Christians and Jews that had been living in this country had had built large uh, temples. They had built large church buildings and they had um, built large synagogues uh, and uh, they had not invested very much in children's education. And we decided to do the opposite. Our rabbis, many have been bivocational. They worked a job. But we, uh, and we didn't build elaborate synagogues. We built very simple synagogues and we invested our money into schools and the training of children. And as a result, our children have grown up in the faith, and they believe they're Jews. They believe what, what Judaism teaches. They didn't secularize. And this is, of course, consistent with what the Scripture has taught us to do. And uh, I often say that the training of a child is the most important thing a church does, because 
And someone told me a few years ago, yeah, you say that, that's a romantic thing to say, but the fact is that children don't pay any money, so that's not the most important thing we do. But you know, that's a really cynical way of looking at it, because I look at it that adults, if they get disgruntled with a church, they just go to another church. It's kind of like the guy you've heard most people have now, the joke about the guy that <coughs> uh, gets rescued after being on a, a deserted island for many years, and he gets on the boat and and, and it, it, he's just looking longingly back at this place where he's lived many years, and there's three structures there. And the captain says, what are these three structures? And he said, well, that was my house. I built, it, I built that house there, and I lived in there. He said, well, that makes sense. Well, what's the other two things? And he said, well, the second one's a house of worship. Every, on the Lord's Day, I would go there and worship the Lord. And he said, what's the other one? He said, oh, it's a church I used to go to. So we adults do that. We get disgruntled, we move around. It's just the way we keep and play musical churches sometimes. But, so we, but, but our faith is still there. And even if we get so discouraged, we're not even like going to church. And this happens, unfortunately, to people. It shouldn't, but it does. The adults are going to uh, die in the faith, most of them. But the children, the children, the children and the young people, that's where the vulnerability is. And teaching them is so important. And that uh, brings me to a conclusion here. I want us to use this season to teach our children the ways of God. Now, every year, from the time I can recall, and I remember my dad getting these letters, people will send me letters, sometimes big epistles, you know, emails about how pagan Christmas is. You're wasting your breath on me. I'm, I'm unredemptive in this way. You're not going to be able to win me over. It's impossible. Uh, I've already, uh, I'm uh, just... I love Christmas too much, and I can't be talked out of it. That's just the way it is. And it's not pagan. It grows out of Hanukkah. Uh, early Christians were Jews. I guess everybody knows that. And so early Christians celebrated Hanukkah. And I've got to tell you about the origins of Hanukkah so you will know why it's important to teach children. Well, the story of Hanukkah is contained in the book of Maccabees, which is between the Old and the New Testament in a collection of books called the Apocrypha. Your great-grandmother had one. If you find you've got an old family Bible somewhere and you open it up, there'll be an apocrypha. Very expensive to print all of this. And since Protestants don't regard it as Scripture, though we honor it and respect it and gives us our history in between the Old and the New Testament, 400 years span, uh, it was easier to leave out. And finally, uh, people stopped reading it all together somewhere in uh, early uh, mid-1800s or so, uh, wasn't read too much in Protestant circles. But there's a lot of good information there, including the most magnificent story from the book of the Maccabees, and here's what happened. The Syrians had conquered Israel, and they were in control everywhere. And they even defiled the temple. They come into the temple, and they offered a pig on the altar, and all kinds of bad things going on like that for Jews. Jews were uh, very angry and upset, and so there was an uprising. Uh, and the family's name was the, was the Hasmonean family, but history called them the Maccabees, meaning hammer, because they hammered away until uh, all, their country was free of uh, foreign uh, oppression. And there's some great stories about guys going under elephants. They brought the elephants in. That's uh, ancient tanks. And they're coming in with the elephants. And all the guys rush out under the uh, elephants and stick the elephants with a spear. And uh, I don't know how they cleaned all that up later, but that's another story. But one of the things that happened was that the temple couldn't get supplies in. And, and, the, and there was no oil to light the menorahs. And so uh, the people kept lighting them anyway. And for eight days without any oil... They burn miraculously. And, of course, the Jews, seeing this as God's hands and God delivering their country, begin to celebrate a, a feast that's not in the Old Testament, but it's in the New Testament. It's called the Feast of Dedication in the New Testament. Jesus celebrated it, and it's what we know as Hanukkah, or the Feast of Lights, if you will. And so uh, th the reason that Jewish people created these feast days and God had prescribed them to do this, is so they could remember. And on these occasions you teach, Passover, for example, in a Passover ceremony from which we get our uh, communion service, almost entire communion service comes from the Passover, the oldest says to the youngest, or the youngest says to the oldest, why is this night unlike any other night? And the youngest says, because this was the night that the Lord brought us out from Egypt with a mighty hand. 
Why on this day do we do such and such and we don't do other things? Because this was the night when God said, surely you shall you know, eat in haste because it's the Lord's Passover and you shall depart from Egypt in haste and so forth. And so there's these questions and answers uh, from which we get the, uh, uh, the structures of catechism, of teaching people the faith. And this happened in Judaism. Jesus had gone through all of this. He was well prepared. He knew what he was about when he was 12 years old. Why did we do the 12 days of Christmas today? Well, because kids can remember that for the rest of their life when they hear the 12 days of Christmas, and some of us that never heard this story before, when we hear it, we're like, yeah, and we'll laugh, and, and we'll remember this teaching moment when Pastor Doug presented to us the 12 days of Christmas as a teaching tool, because your brain is structured in such a way that new information has to have some place to go. And so he gave it some place to go. People have been doing this for a long time. And that's why the Lord says, take this time to teach your children. So, every year I get out the nativity set. And I've done this now for years. And my little uh, grandkids would come, uh, three and four years old. And they knew where the donkey had to be here because it's where he was last year. And then the sheep is over here. And sheep go back. And the donkey, what's a do bo donkey do? And then... Uh, and uh, I haven't seen a donkey. And then we've got to go see a donkey. And then, then there's like, this is his mommy. Her name is Mary. And this is Joseph. And, and they tell that story in their own kind of way. And they get it mixed up. Has everybody noticed that? Like the kid in the Sunday school class that says, where's round John Virgin? When they put it up into the nativity set, they wanted to see round John Virgin. And, and uh, so that's getting a, a little messed up. But we've been doing this along, and we always do it crudely, and, we, and none of us are really good at it. I was raised in a little church uh, in the first part of my life before we moved to South America. We'd go down in the basement in the church. That's where everybody ought to go for Sunday school. Pipes are running overhead, you know, and it, it smells like a little bit of mildew in there. And, and uh, this, is, this is the way God ordained it, I think, because that's what I remember where I learned things. And there was a primitive kind of video system called a flannel graph. Anybody remember those? And then they get stick figures, and they stick onto the velvet, right? And the uh, and re reason I remembered is because they only had a few of these. There's a big box, and they would say, Today, little children, we're talking about John the Baptist. And put John the Baptist up there. This is John the Baptist. And I would say, Well, it was Elijah just a few weeks ago. And, uh, and the teacher would say, Out. You go out. Go see your mom and dad, which meant I was in trouble. What'd I say? What'd I say? And these, you know, in, in, in southern West Virginia, it was like, you know, you kids shut up and sit down. I'm trying to teach you about the Prince of Peace here, you know, uh, and get all exasperated. And then we'd learn songs. Our kiss was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And you remember those all your life. And you know, however sophisticated we may think we get, our training almost always you can trace it all back to there. Even the most complicated lessons we think we know all go back to those moments. So, enjoy the holidays. Worship. Come here on Christmas Eve and celebrate with us that night. Enjoy all the services and the choir concert. Enjoy it as a religious holiday. But don't get mad at the heathen for celebrating too. And they don't know who Jesus is, so it's okay for them you know, to celebrate the way they celebrate it. Well, sometimes it's not, but, you know, it's okay to, you know, uh, I started to say the Easter Bunny. I got him out of the wrong season here. But the Santa Claus and, and uh, Jack Frost and all that kind of stuff, it's just fine. Nothing's wrong with that. It's not, a Chris, it's not the Christian way of celebrating, but it's not anything contrary either and children have a blast with this and just teach take each moment to teach along and all the things that's presented on TV talk about it like the Lord says when they get up when they go to bed and particularly when they're little when they've got all those questions answer their questions they're fascinated by it use this season that's what it's for all the lights all the candles all the ceremony all the songs all the hustle and bustle and even as people are buying and selling don't get aggravated at that. A lot of businesses stay in business because on this last month of the year, they finally make enough money to make a profit and keep people in uh, making a living so they can feed their families. It's a good time of the year. Enjoy it. Be thankful. And above all, teach it 
to your children. We're going to dismiss here in just a moment. And before we do, the promise I've made to this congregation is that we always have prayer for the sick or any need you may have. And so we're going to take just a moment uh, uh, to give you opportunity if the altar workers will come and stand here before we're dismissed. We invite you to come for a moment of prayer. are open. Would you sing with me that carol we sang at the beginning of the service? O come, O come, Emmanuel.
Well, I want to dismiss with one more carol, and we'll just sing together. This will be the benediction, and it goes like this. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plain, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strain. Gloria in excelsis Deo. God bless you. Go in peace. Have a wonderful Christmas season.